All right. Good afternoon. I would like to thank everyone for joining us for our part three of our community conversations a community conversation on the State of the Union hosted by the Lewis Walker Institute at Western Michigan University. It's, we also are being co-sponsored by our Kalamazoo County Alpac, the Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation Kalamazoo Law Team, our WMU Office of Diversity and Inclusion, and the WMU CETA Scholars Program. So I thank you for all of the support that we have from everyone that is uh, participating with us and supporting us. Um, first, I just want to make a couple of few, a few announcements. Um, this broadcast is being um, shared live on Facebook and um, it will also be posted on YouTube at the conclusion of our of our broadcast and once we do a little bit of editing. Uh, so we'll make sure that we have access to that in the future. All right. Again, I just want to review with everyone a little bit about our mission here at the Lewis Walker Institute. Our mission is to develop an understanding of race and ethnic relations, to promote an appreciation of diverse people and culture of the United States and other nations, create more equitable and inclusive communities and institutions. And one of the things or one of the ways that we are trying to meet our mission is through having these types of community conversations. And so we thank you so much for being involved. We thank you so much for your participation. And one final announcement, I would like to um, just remind everyone that Wire Summer, our youth development program, our Wire Summer is at home and our registration is still open through Friday. Spaces are filling very quickly. We're so excited to be able to start our remote summer learning program beginning June 29th and ending July 31st. It's super exciting. We've got so much fun stuff planned for our students this summer. I think you're going to really enjoy it. Um, one thing that I would like to remind everyone is that you can get more access or more information on our WIRE 2020 summer program at wmich.edu forward slash Walker Institute dash WIRE. So those conclude my announcements. And so what I'd like to do now is introduce you to our panel. Look at this esteemed panel that we have today. So I just welcome everyone um, to today's conversation. So first, we're going to start off with uh, Dr. Don Cooney. Please uh, introduce yourselves to us. We're so excited to have you. Hi. Thank you, Bichar, for letting me be a part of this. I'm hearing an echo. Are you hearing an echo? Um, not right now. I've I'm okay. okay. You know, I've muted one of your your devices, so I think you should be okay. Okay, great, great. So, okay, um, I I teach in the School of Social Work here, and I work with Lou Chara and Lou and D Doug Davidson at the uh, Lewis Walker Institute. Thanks so much for being here. All right, our namesake. Dr. Walker. Well, hello, and I'm so delighted that you're hosting another very important conversation given the situations or issues and events going on around our country, throughout our country and around the world. I'm Lou Walker, and um, I came to Western in 1964, retired officially in 1999, and uh, I'm just delighted to still be a part of the Lewis Walker Institute for the Study of Race and Ethnic Relations. And I'm super, super delighted to have Dr. Wallace as the head of the Walker Institute. So honored to have you. Our, today we have our chief Dudal, 
and our Lieutenant Lillard from WMU Public Safety. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Jeffrey Lillard, uh, Lieutenant here at West Michigan University. I've been here for 27 years. Uh, I've been working with the community uh, for that entire time. I know I've been, I'm advising now a couple of different student groups and making sure that I have a, a air to the street in a sense. And, uh, and I'm glad to be here today. And I'm Carol Dedow, I'm the Deputy Chief of Western Place. I was a student here from 1980 to 83 and then painted a job here with our department. I never seemed to find my way off campus apparently, so I'm still here after 36 years. Um, I am also a, a career mentor for the CETA Scholars Program as well, which is my most recent highlight of uh, my career as Deputy Chief. So I thank you very much for including us in this conversation. Thank you both so much for being here. We truly appreciate your presence. All right, we have one of our students on the call right now, one of our student leaders, Allegra Ellis. Would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, absolutely. Um, hey, y'all, thank you so much for having me again. My name is Allegra Kistler Ellis. I use she, they pronouns. Um, I am a student finishing up my last few classes of undergrad this semester at Western Michigan University. Um, I'll graduate this semester with a double degree in social work in Spanish, and then I'll be starting right into um, the accelerated master's program of social work at Western. Thank you so much, Allegra. We're glad that you're here. Next, we have um, philanthropist, um, entrepreneur and leader of our Kalamazoo Thank you, Dr. Wallace, uh, for inviting me to this conversation. So I wear several hats in the community so as a business owner and also for our newly uh, started chapter of Mothers of Black Boys United for Social Change right before COVID happened. So I'm happy to be a part of that. And the co-chair with uh, prosecuting attorney Jeff Getting of ALPAC, which stands for Advocates, Leaders for Police and Community Trust. Um, hopefully I got that all right. That's a lot, that's a mouthful. But um, the, I am the community arm of that and our job is to bring the community together with the law enforcement side of it to develop relationships and trust in our community. So thanks for having me. We have another student lead vice president for the Western Student Association, Kobe Wright. <laughs> um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jacoby Wright. As she said, I am the incoming vice president uh, for the student body here at WMU. Uh, I am a fourth year um, <laughs> student studying flight science and business management uh, with a double minor in entrepreneurship and French. Um, well, interested to see where this conversation takes us today. Much, Jacoby. We are glad to. Our prosecuting attorney, as well as our co chair of our act, Prosecutor Jeff Getting. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jeff Getting. I'm the Kalamazoo County Prosecuting Attorney. I'm, uh, I've been practicing law here in Kalamazoo as an assistant prosecutor, as a criminal defense attorney, and as the elected prosecutor since 1990. Um, back before that, before law school, I went to Western Michigan University where I had a double major in sociology and criminal justice. And I'm proud to say I was one of Dr. Walker's um, students, maybe not his best, but at least one of uh, his students and uh, learned from one of the masters back in the day. We're so glad to have you. Uh, next up, we. Tony Lewis, our Office of Civil Rights. Uh, good afternoon, excuse me, good afternoon, thank you. And uh, I look forward to, uh, my name is Anthony Lewis, Tony Lewis, excuse me. 
and uh, I serve as the uh, Director of Business and Community Affairs for the Michigan Department of Civil Rights. And uh, I am looking forward to, uh, you know, to continuing the dialogue just like uh, Jacoby and see where the dialogue takes us today. Thank you so much for joining us. Ret Captain Stacy Love, Chair of our TRHT Law Team. Thank you, Dr. Wood. There, so I'll go with also being a proud Bronco times two, and I had both uh, Dr. Walker and Dr. Cooney, so proud of that just as well. Uh, my perspective today um, is unique, I believe, because it uh, is black and blue, black woman in America, blue for the career field that I chose, and I'm also affiliated with MOB, as Sabrina already explained, and also a community um, advisor for the WMU Black Criminal Justice Student Association and uh, social action chair for Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Thank you. Much blood better. Next, we have President Taylor West, our president of our Western Student Association. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for this invitation again to um, participate in these impactful discussions. Um, my name is Taylor West, like Dr. Wow said. I am entering my fourth year at Western, um, majoring in social work with a minor in interdisciplinary legal studies. My hopes for after graduation, um, just like Allegra, to um, participate in the accelerated program we have at, here at Western to get my master's in a year, and then hopefully go to law school where I can use both degrees um, to work in either criminal um, procedure or political policy. So thanks for inviting me today. Thanks for being here, Taylor. Coming from the meeting, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us. Um, and next we have our director of our Kalamazoo Valley Community College Law um, Enforcement um, Academy. Vic Ledbetter. I'm glad to be here. Um, I'm Vic Ledbetter. I worked for Kalamazoo Public Safety for 25 plus years, retired as a captain. Um, currently, I run the Police Academy at KBCC, where I have instituted a lot of programs to make sure that our cadets know how to treat um, everyone with dignity and respect. And I'm very proud of the work that we're doing here in partnership with the Lewis Walker Institute. And um, just look forward to having a healthy conversation today. I think I, instead of with my personal battery of questions, we're gonna go ahead and just um, take it straight to our Facebook Live questions, because we've got some good ones. And we're so grateful, like I said, to have um, Deputy Chief Vidal and uh, Lieutenant Lillard here. So I'm going to ask this question to you first, and then I would like the rest of the panel to please uh, respond. So there's this question specifically focuses on WMU public safety. So with relationship that um, Black people have traditionally had with um, with the police locally and nationally. What reforms has WMU Public Safety made to assure the safety and equity, um, the safety and equity of treatment in dealing with black people at WMU or those visits? Thank you for that question. Um, most recently, over the last uh, probably a year ago, about this time, we have started to pursue accreditation process which entails a number of standards and practices, proofs to put in to raise the bar, so to speak, hold us accountable in a number of different areas. We are in the process of updating and renewing all of our policies, um, particularly as it relates to our relationships with um, all people of color, as well as uh, black lives. And we are in that process right now. We have implemented and um, gone through, attended 
three different um, trainings involving communication and intrinsic bias, uh, cultural competency, racial pro profiling and implicit bias. We had not done that before this process. Um, we are complying with the laws as it relates to use of force, mandatory use of force databases. Again, it's raising our bar. We're renewing this policies and hope to obtain our accreditation in the fall of 2020. After that, we are required every year to produce proofs in connection with those standards and those performance levels. We continue to train in assorted different topics. Um, we've done a number of things since Chief Merlot took over as well. In 2019, 2018, we were uh, awarded Campus Safety Initiative for some of the things put in place regarding our engagement with our community and our students particularly. Uh, we've been particularly proud of our relationship with our students. We engage continually with those students. Lieutenant Lillard often um, sits on advisory committees. I have uh, most recently, as you know, as I stated, a mentor for the CETA Scholar, um, which we find extremely important. That's it in a nutshell. Thank you. You did. Um, so thank you for of the uh, trainings and program that um, that our police force has has been engaging in. I think one question that is is really been core, and this doesn't just have to be um, Lieutenant Lillard and, and Deputy Chief, but I think the other question that really that that a lot of folks have been asking is how are we guaranteeing that students and students of color will be they have interactions with our police department. Um, as we know, one of the brought us here today was the chokehold that resulted of George Floyd. I guess more into the core of of, of our our leaders have been inquiring what like what are we doing to the events from happening here at WMU. What are we doing to prevent the events here in Kalamazoo? We don't participate, nor have we ever, with chokeholds. Chokeholds are deadly force. Um, all of our use of force, each and every time, one of our officers, and this is, we've been doing this for several years now, if I get a use of force subject control form, from one of our officers in reference to a case, anytime our officer even displays a taser or a weapon of any kind, touch of any kind of a subject, I review each and every one of those. Not only do I review what is written, any of the videos, I pull the reports. If they happen to be on an assist with another agency, I pull all of those reports. I pull all of those videos as, as well. And then I have to make a determination of whether or not that use of force was appropriate in that situation. Um, we keep a file, and that's one of the things for accreditation as well. There's there's a file, there's a summary. After a year that you have to review your use of force, are there changes to be made? And there are times when I have reviewed a use of force that may require additional training for that officer or additional training for um, our officers in general, the entire department. So that's something that we look carefully at and it's constantly evolving as you uh, can understand even before the tragic death of George, George Floyd. Really th thank you for putting that into perspective as well. Um, as we were, were really seeking to look and understand a little bit more um, from of the perspective trust here at the Walker Institute and so as well as our special guests that we have here today so let's cut out I'll throw this over to 
Drs. Cooney and Walker first, but could you please put this into perspective? You know, why, why now? Why, why is it that we had our, our unrest of the 1960s? We've seen what has happened um, after Rodney King in the 1990s. So we, we seem to go through these experiences in cycles, but we're yet to see the type of core changes that our community are demanding. Um, what's your take on that? Uh, Dr. Dr. Walker Creek. <laughs> I did. Again, just see people like um, Jeff and Stacy and Carol, people I've known for many years. Just make my heart feel so good to know that you're in the struggle with us. And, um, but. I don't, I, to answer your question, you were breaking up, but I think you were asking about somewhat of a comparison between um, the 60s and maybe 70s and today. Um, as I think about it, we continue to have the issues because of ingrained institutional racism. <laughs> I was talking to someone today about the lending institutions in Kalamazoo and the treatment of people of color who would go in for loans. Also, when it came to Kalamazoo, they still had covenants that white people could not sell their property to people of color or at the time Negroes. Um, so we have this deeply embedded system of a uh, systematic system of racism that have uh, are responsible for all of the inequ for most of the inequities we see among African Americans and more recently people of color. And um, in thinking about it last night and responding to some of the things going on in the country. I said, you know, to myself, self, we here in Kalamazoo must encourage our top leaders to form or to create a convention, to convene, to convene a convention on racial justice, where all of these institutions would be involved and to come up with a comprehensive set of plans, strategies, reforms that will make a difference in the lives of all people in our community. I see this as a win-win situation that would also address housing, issues in health care, in medical care, in so I was just troubled as I was thinking about this last night, that what must we do to really make profound changes? It has to be done at the local level. Because what was started in the 60s, the black movement, important progress was made in terms of civil rights, but there is so much that we need to do and do it here in our own community. Dr. Cooney. Um, the, what happened at the end of Dr. King's life, he talked about the unfinished revolution and that was economic justice because why we had dramatically advanced civil rights during the 1960s we had not substantially or significantly affected the economic situation of people of color in this country and i think this has been simmering ever since 
But I think that the COVID um, pandemic really brought this to the floor. We talked about essential workers and people having to go to work. And we were calling these people essential workers and they were largely people of color who were going into work without protection and the rate of the number of people of color who were getting COVID-19 was triple the number of white people. So I think it was made clear, if, if, if we're essential workers, how come we're not making enough to live on? And you put us out there, but you don't give us the protections that we need. So I think that was simmering and then the blatant murder of George Floyd brought this to the floor. So I, I think we're in a position now where there have been some significant things happening, but we have to keep our eyes on the prize. And for me, the, eyes, the prize is that everybody in this society has access to what they need to lead a fully human life. And we're far from that right now. So they keep talking about going back to normal, but normal doesn't work. We need to go forward to creating a system which is moves us away from racism and moves us toward economic justice. And I think that's the challenge we face now how to make this result in the transformative changes that this society needs. Thank you, Dr. Walker. Thank you, Dr. Kuhn. Were there any of our other people that would like to add to that in terms of how we've gotten here? Why now? Do we just talk or do we just? Okay, well, I, I, I agree with what has been said as far as the COVID and essential workers. However, I don't think that COVID brought that on. I think that this has been something that has been simmering for many, many, many years. Yeah. Um, wages have been held low for many years. Um, considering the fact that someone making $12 an hour right now is considered to be doing okay with $12 an hour, which really isn't okay. I made $12 an hour as a college student at Kellogg's 32 years ago. So here we go, 32 years later, and we're still talking about a $12 an hour job. And now people have to work multiple jobs in order for just to be able to pay for basic necessities. We're not talking about extra stuff like going out to eat. We're talking about putting food on your table, paying for a roof over your head. Um, and some of the gentrification that has been happening downtown right now, no one can afford to live there. And what it's doing is it's pushing people out. That was way before COVID. So this is this stuff has been bubbling and bubbling and bubbling and bubbling. And then COVID comes along and really pushes it through because African-Americans suffer. We are number one when it comes to heart disease, number one when it comes to infant mortality, number one when it comes from become when it comes to heart stroke, poverty levels were number one. So there's a lot of areas that causes stress on our bodies that we are number one in, and this didn't just happen overnight. So we have to learn that we have to start dealing with these things from an economic standpoint, not just a social standpoint to say, let's give this or give that, give that. How do we help people to come up? Because at the end of the day, we're not looking for handouts. What we are looking for is an opportunity. And we want to be able to take care of our families just like everyone else takes care of their families. We want to be able to put food on our table. We want to have a roof over our head. And we want our children to be safe. We want them to have safe drinking water. We want them to go to safe schools. We want them to be able to play out in the yard and not have to worry about if they're going to be shot or something else is going to happen or over-policed. I just watched a video the other day. It, which just happened. It wasn't here in town. But you were talking four teenage boys, four teenage boys. And an office, it was in Atlanta, and they had guns on these boys. There's no reason for that. So 
you're talking about trauma, that is trauma. And then at the end of the day, they will say, well, no one was hurt. No one was hurt physically, but the trauma that's released on these kids is unbearable. So, and that's been happening for a long, long time. Those are the things that we have to start addressing and start treating people as human beings. Thank you Thanks. so much. Um, I think and it's interesting our, our a little bit and you had a question I believe for our panel and your question is actually consistent with some of the questions that are on Facebook so if you could please field those then that would be great I, I I I didn't have a question for the panel I saw your chat I saw earlier there was some questions from GH1K uh, for the WMU police, but the questions didn't come from me, and I don't see the Facebook questions. But if you want to pass them on to me or verbalize them, I'd be happy to answer any that you have. Well, not a problem. A GH1K is me. If that's showing up as that's me. So Sabrina, those are my questions. So you're so Sabrina, ask you then to ask your questions then of our law enforcement officer at WMU. So my question was regarding, so oftentimes what I hear in law enforcement is there's a lot of talk about um, de-escalation training and all these this training that happens. Well, I think that's great and the training needs to happen, but I also know that training happens and then what happens on the street may not be related to what they were trained on. So how is that monitored? How are they monitoring that the training that happens is the actual training that happens on the street. So if chokeholds are not, you know, we don't do chokeholds, then how do you know that those aren't happening? And when those do happen on the street, because we know that those things happen, um, what's the disciplinary action for those? So is it just a write-up or is it, you know, you get so many times to do something and you keep your job? How long does a person get to keep stay on a job before we say enough is enough? we don't need you representing the law enforcement because you are an endanger to the community that you were supposed to be helping. So that's one of my questions. I'll let that be answered. Okay. Uh, well, what takes place is if there's a complaint by someone, it's formally written up and it's given to our administrative department. Once the administrative department gets it, there's a formal investigation on everything that takes place. Uh, whatever evidence we have a video or cause we have mics and we have uh, cameras on our vehicles. So whatever evidence we have, everything is looked at. Uh, once that's looked at, it is followed up on with that officer. If there's a, a reprimand or, or whatever disciplinary action that needs to take place is given to that officer at that time. So we, we watch carefully what has happened. I can only speak for our department. I can't speak for the rest of the county. I look carefully at things like that. So if they're, and in Western Michigan University, not only the union, the collective bargaining FOP, our patrol officers and detectives are under that. The university employees, non-bargaining employees as well, have different rules of conduct. So they can be disciplined under those different levels as well. So if they are at a section one, what we call in that, if somebody was exhibiting or doing a chokehold that I had a complaint and was able to see video on, then that is up to and including um, uh, termination. So it depends on the incident. It depends on the severity of the incident, what actually happened. Um, I personally absolutely love video. When we first started getting these, I, especially in my, um, my position right now, the more videos that I can review, the easier it is on me instead of um, different eyewitnesses. I like cameras, I like everything. I like phones, give me, give me what you have. Um, so it depends on the specific act by that officer. And it could be um, a written reprimand, it could be a suspension. So each incident is looked at carefully and separately actually. And you know, each officer is entitled to due process in an employment setting as well. I don't know if I answered your question or not. 
Nope, that's good. It's nice to see you too. <laughs> you too. <laughs> and thank you so much. Yes. <laughs> there is a follow up to that question. And this is from our Facebook audience. In a given year, how frequently are campus public safety officers engaging in a use of force? And what type of situation or condition does WMU sanction a use of force? Um, so we've been fairly lucky. Our call volume, especially since I first started here, has gone down quite a bit, actually. Um, it's never been safer, but our, our enrollment has gone down as well. So our use of force incidents that I review are basically displays. Um, a lot of where we've assisted another department, we don't have a lot of hands-on-hand -hand, um, use of force. And I can say that proudly and not because I'm covering up anything, we just don't. Uh, we've been very fortunate. And part of that is um, the leadership of this organization, Chief Berlow, and how he wants us to engage and communicate with uh, members of our community. I am a huge proponent and always have been, and Dr. Walker has known me for 30, 40 years, oh no. And he knows that um, our first line is to communicate with people and engage in people. I've done that since I was a, what I call the baby, baby officer. And that's been our method from day one when I started. I was a huge proponent of, of verbal judo back in, uh, golly, many years ago when I was an instructor, a uh, huge proponent of verbal judo as opposed to um, anything physical. It de-escalates situations left and right. I remember going on a call and one of the officers standing back and me using verbal judo and them saying, I guess that stuff works. I'd like to learn more. So it's different training and continually to find different ways of communicating or de-escalation techniques. I continually learn from some of my younger officers. I watch different videos and I just am amazed at some of the ways they have been communicating with members of this community. Um, I sound like a pride mo proud mother, but I truly am because I continue to learn as well. And I know Lieutenant Lillard and I just recently spoke of this, how um, I think advanced they are in, in moving to communicate with people. Our first thing, you engage, communicate before, and it's a strong de-escalation technique. So Carol, put a number on it for me. In terms give, me of your best, give me your best estimate of how many use of force incidents did you review last year? Um, I would probably say 20, maybe 25. And most of those are displays. For some reason they, um, or maybe grab somebody, somebody pulled away. Anytime they use any kind of force, anytime they're touching, they are filling out one of these forms. So I, we're more restrictive than most departments, um, but that's how we want it. I don't think you can really, um, analyze if you're not pretty restrictive. That's for our department. Thank you. Oh, and I'll just I'll chime in. Sorry. Um, just wanted to add that um, last week when we had uh, conversations with the uh, president's cabinet, Scott Merlo, the chief of uh, police, was there, and uh, one of the demands that um, student government brought is for to see a monthly reporting uh, online of any any instances of brutality or use of force or profiling um, of any nature. Um, that way, you know, students can see it, uh, it's available, and, you know, officers can see it and they can see if there's a problem happening. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you, Jacoby, and thank you for bringing that up so that we're aware of some of uh, coming forth from our students um, to know so we can also follow up with that. I would like to bring in um, Captain Stacey and uh, Director Vic. Uh, I'm going to give you guys a, a, a brief break, um, Deputy Chief and Lieutenant. Um, chat that's saying, has any 
inquired about the removal of the Blue Lives Matter that are sometimes prominently displayed on police vehicles, including those here at WMU. This particular Facebook says, I've always thought this is inappropriate. I will, they display, are they trying to send? If not, if it's one, a retort to the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, so I can kind of answer that actually, because um, that was something that a student brought up to me, and I actually asked about it during this during the meeting that we had. Um, and actually, what I found out is that's been in place for a lot longer than we think. Um, there's one for fire. There's one for ambulances. Um, so it's not it's not really against the movement. It was in place before um, things like this you know, started happening. Um, not saying that. You know, it should stay, but I think a lot of people don't understand that, you know, that was there for a long time and it has, you know, a different symbology. Um, and I, I see you shaking your head, Tony. I'm interested to see what you think about that. Well, you know, I, I don't want to actually, I know this question was for uh, uh, Stacey and Nick, so I, I won't sit this one out. I'll come back. No, Tony, I'm going to take yours too. No, I, and I would say, yeah, go ahead and take it, Tony, because it was specific. I think from, uh, I think I was at that meeting where um, it came up and Chief Merlo was there and a student is asking it about Western in particular and some stickers they had on their car. So like the deputy chief said, you know, um, people shouldn't speak for other people's departments. So I will defer to them as well in whatever Tony's comment is. Yeah, I guess uh, the one thing I would say is I, you know, I caution when, you know, when folks say, oh, well, this has been in place for, uh, you know, for a long time. I mean, I, I'd be interested to find out when exactly they were placed on these patrol cars and when exactly, you know, because I, I, you know, and something tells me that, you know, I, like I said, I, just from uh, experience, you know, and like I said, it would be interesting to, to see because, because obviously, and, you know, one thing I also say, is that you know sometimes you know you have to evolve and you know and also there are times when certain symbols and certain things that may have been meant in a particular way uh in its inception and like i said i'm i'm just a, i'm just skeptical by nature but um you know with certain things and that's just because of my years in civil rights and my interactions and you know especially when i was an investigator so i'm kind of you know that's why i'd like to i would definitely like to uh you know, research this because the investigator in me is now is coming out. But um, but but as I said before, you know, we, there needs to be an evolution there because there, you know, because there also needs to be an understanding that sometimes symbols that were acceptable uh, sometimes can evolve to now have a separate meaning than what they were originally intended to be. And as I said, I'm skeptical in terms of that response, but I can't speak for that department. I can't speak for that department. So that's why, like I said, I would I would like to research that a little bit more. But that doesn't make it acceptable now, just because at a certain period in time in the past it was acceptable then. You know, so like I said, so I think that there needs to be. I, I you know I'm interested in that, um, but I am interested in that in that in that dialogue because, like I said before, um, Blue Lives Matter. I mean, for myself, who's been in this, and I'm going to address that specifically. Um, at no point that I hear at no point did I hear that particular um, terminology used uh, prior to uh, Black Lives Matter being, okay? And that's just a personal, and that's personally, so I can't speak for any other, I'm just saying this now personally, I can't speak for any other, and that's why I would be interested to know when that was placed on a patrol car, you know, because it seems to, because that particular, that direct particular, uh, you know, verbiage, okay, I have not heard before. So, like I said, prior to, of course, the Black Lives Matter, and you know, so like I said, but the, but that's, and like I said, I don't, I'm not aware of, you know, individual departments, and I'm saying speaking from myself and my professional interactions throughout the state, in other areas. So that's why I was shaking my, that was why I was shaking my head, you know, in terms of, you know, the skepticism because, you know, as I said before, you know, and also as I said before. Just because something may have been, you know, acceptable at a previous time does not make it acceptable now. And I mean, I think we see that with certain monuments. I think we see that with certain flag representations. I think we're seeing that now. 
And I and and um and you know sometimes you know I liken it to growing up, and I also use analogy. You know, when I was 10 years old, I had certain things and certain posters up in my room. When I was 17 years old, those posters didn't look the same to me anymore. Okay. So I think that, you know, so now, and that was because I matured, you know, I recognized, I matured, I recognized there's also certain things that, um, that I had that, that, um, before, before I was educated on certain things and how they, and how the people I'm there to serve would perceive that. Well, then I need to take that into account rather than saying, well, you know, it's been on there for a while. So, you know, we're going to, you know, it's been on there for a while, like I said, but I wasn't privy to the conversation. And that's why I wanted to kind of sit this one out, but that's, I'll just leave it at that. Hey, Tony, I did look up some dates on some things while you were talking, and I agree with you. I didn't hear a thing about Blue Lives Matter before Black Lives Matter came about, and I believe Black Mar Lives Matter came about after Trayvon Martin's um, uh, murder. I believe it was somewhere in that area that I started hearing the Black Lives Matter portion of it, and so when I looked at Blue Lives Matter, it, was at, it says it was founded in 2014. Um, Trayvon was murdered in 2012, so... I don't believe that either. It was not around before Black Lives Matter. From what I heard from our vice president um, for diversity and inclusion is it was uh, referred to as a thin blue line. And then um, the Blue Lives Matter kind of just stole um, the logo in a sense and kind of took it over. Um, so that's that's where I got my information from in that sense. And if I can add to that. So there are two different. The Blue Lives Matter did come after that totally separate than what we have, the thin blue line flag. The thin blue line flag represented um, law enforcement and was often flown in support of the men and women who do this job every day and in memory of those officers killed in the line of duty. Two totally different things, and I agree. The Blue Lives Matter, that came after the Black Lives Matter. The thin blue line, that was not. That was here for many years, and that's what it signifies for those of us who are working every day and in memory in our workout room i saw that today i was on the treadmill and in memory i'd say a quick prayer in memory of those officers killed in the line of duty that's what that represents still to us this day separate from the thin blue line or um the blue, blue lives matter that's our perspective because that that and all the language. Um, I think back to Sabrina, um, it is my understanding that Lives Matter emerged following Michael Brown's murder in Ferguson, Missouri. That's when we saw our first um, protest in the name of Black Lives Matter. Of course, that what also came that, after- That would have been 2014. Uh, okay, so, okay, I knew you it was had, somewhere after the Trayvon, okay. Yeah, so within, of time of 2014 you had um you, you had yeah you had mike brown you had eric garner then once you think about tamir rice we're still thinking about and and dealing with trayvon martin you know and having to adjust to the emotional responses of that and those being so public um but thank you discussion this has been phenomenal we're going to keep going but questions that I would like to bring to um, our group. Actually, before I move on, Vic, did you guys have anything that you had in general, especially when you add that perspective of being black and blue? Was there something else that you wanted to add to this conversation before we move on? Uh, this is Stacey. Just encapsulating uh, this whole conversation, again, thank you for having it. It shows the importance and my, um, just heartfelt belief because my background and expertise, if, if you will, is in community policing. So building those relationships with the community that we serve. But when you wrap in the educational piece, maybe we'll get to the point that we don't need as many of these forms because we have an educated community. Maybe that's what we can work on um, in our hope to be beloved Kalamazoo. So that historical perspective, sometimes I have conversations with people simply asking, why does racism exist? Like if you just have to answer that question with the um, answer being as sad and ignorant as it is and horrendous, the fact of the matter is the foundation of our country um, is just entrenched in a hierarchy 
of human value. Race itself, as my instructors on here know, uh, is a social construct. And so when you uh, wrap in um, laws and beginning with even that ideology of policing, if you will, even though it wasn't called that then, but slave catchers, and then you go to black codes and Jim Crow laws, lynching where quote unquote law enforcement was there and nobody was getting in trouble for it. And generational, that stuff lasting, people having certain perceptions and um, stereotypes and opinions about people. And the fact that we need to focus on our governmental entities, particularly the criminal justice system. So talking about not just the police, but police, courts, and, and corrections being representative of the communities that they serve. Um, so that means intentional education, intentional recruiting, intentional hiring, intentional promoting, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, I think we'll be at a better place. So this is uh, great that we're doing today, but it, it cannot stop. Thank you. You know, I really can't add anything else that's been said, but I just want to highlight too, I, it's not getting a lot of coverage, but they're now saying that there are five black men who were found hanging in trees. So, you know, this really concerns me. Um, I think there's more to the story and I, I, it just, that's just the state of where we are. Um, and I just want people to pay attention to that and don't just think that that's suicide. I, I, you understand what I'm saying? From my perspective, I don't know, brother, I, I don't know any black men who, who's done that, and I definitely don't know anybody who would do it in the tree. So, again, this is something we need to pay attention to and just keep the conversation going. And um, the week, because as you know, in a lot of these conversations that we've um, most about what's been going on, what uh, we've seen in the media. So we do that have been reported of um, of men being lynched, and and then then I also video that came out. It was a personal security video at a family home. And to the to the extent to um, share your thoughts on this. The situation only about the age of nine or ten. He's playing basketball, his family. As he's playing basketball, this cruiser starts to his blood. As this cruiser drops, a little boy stops, holds his ball, and sits behind his family's Jeep. As he held himself or hide himself from being seen by driving by. My heart broke because to me it from the police because his asked he stepped back out to resume playing ball. I'd like to get your take on that but that situation because that is and that's a bit we should not have are afraid of the of a police cruiser driving by in their own yard. Thoughts, panelists. Allegra. Yeah, I think this can be very easily related back to Tony. What you were talking about about um, evolution and retiring things and phenomena and institutions that are no longer serving their purpose. Now the police force as an institution was never intended to serve the community. It was, like has already been said, created out of slave patrol. So inherently in the police institution is racism, is sexism, um, is oppression. And so if we have kids, black boys and girls and children being inherently scared of a police car driving by, is that not... Um, does that not bring to question why haven't we moved on from the conversation of police reform and why haven't we moved towards the conversation more so of defunding the police and redistributing that money into uh, community resources, safety nets, education, health, 
um, to then change that entire scope, that entire framework? Why are we not um, on a broader scale talking about retiring the police force as an institution and shifting more towards community-based um, safety and taking that money and actually using it to help communities instead of having police target black and brown communities consistently. Um, I think that that is a really good connection to make because if we're talking about um, retiring flags and statues that have inherent racist historical contexts, why are we not um, applying that same thought process to racist institutions like the police? Why aren't we talk Why aren't we having that conversation with each other um, on a broader, more radical scale? I think if if we are going to continue to talk about police reform, we're going to continue to see what we've been seeing um, since police reform has been talked about for like the past 30 years, and nothing has worked. We've talked about de-escalation; it has not worked. Uh, very apparent, especially in the past week. Um, with the murders of black women all over the country. Um, so how, how long do we have to continue to have this conversation? How long do we have to wait to retire a racist institution at the sacrifice of black and brown lives? I'd like to jump in. Uh, hi, can you guys hear me? I just hopped in. Um, so Perfect. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm Dahlia Sanchez. I am the VP of Diversity and Inclusion for Western um, Student Association. And yeah, I'm just hopping on the call to kind of join in now. Um, could you guys repeat the question? Maybe I could jump in from there. Yeah, just for clear, stepping in for Taylor and I have a, another meeting to get to. Um, but thank you for the conversation. Thank you, Taylor. Thank you, Dahlia, for that switch. Uh, we'll talk to you guys again later. So, Dahlia, the current question is, we were actually describing, we were talking about a video that's gone viral of the little boy who was playing basketball in his yard, and he hid behind his Jeep once he saw a police car um, driving past. And so, we're really just about, is this our current state of being and what we can do to change things? So, if you want, you can just, you know, let that marinate for a minute. And I want to, um, Again, ask for other members of the panel to respond to that, uh, that question and then also respond to what Blair was talking about. I mean, again, she used the D word again. She talked about being police. She talked about community policing. Like, really, what does that mean? And what does that mean? Because some people, when we talk about the fund, defund police, people think, oh, you're going to remove a total and complete police budget, and now we're going to use all that money somewhere else. People look at that as, a portion budget and now using it for their program. Um, yet and still, others look at it as completely reconstituting what it is a force does and what and what it will look like. So if we can please talk about provide some definitions so we can get some of throwing these words around these days, especially the media, but we don't all have full understanding of what that means. What would that look like? You know, can I jump in here? Um, you know, I, I haven't seen this video, but what you've described is absolutely heartbreaking. Uh, that that should not be the opinion, the the feelings, the reaction that any child has when when a police car drives down their block, and and you know it 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 speaks to a failure of that police agency. That, that police agency, those officers that are working in that area need to develop better relationships with the communities that they serve. You know, the idea that the police, when, when, when all people see in their neighborhood is the police come in, make arrests, handcuff someone, take people away, they are rightfully afraid of police in their neighborhood because that's all that the police are doing. You know, to have the police stop and get out of their cars and to communicate to that child or to communicate to that child's parents or to meet the people that live on that block 
goes, you know, speaks volumes about how they see themselves. If all they do is insulate themselves in their cars and use their lights and sirens to respond to some place on a call and then handcuff and drag somebody away, why would anybody think that, you know, the, that it was a good thing that the police were in their neighborhood? Part of the issue also becomes, you know, Camden, as we talked about briefly last week, Camden, New Jersey, and the, this idea of reconstituting the police in the much bigger idea that Dr. Walker brought up at the beginning of this conversation. You know, I love the how big his dream is, right? The idea of bringing in all these the community leaders and institutional leadership within the community and student leaders and having a conversation about what's working and what isn't and how can we do this better? Because where we're at now obviously isn't as good as it can be, obviously isn't as good as it should be, obviously needs to be better. Um, and you know where we are now hasn't been planned out. It, it, it's the result of this sort of incremental movement as opposed to having big ideas like Dr. Walker's and saying, this is what our community should be. But some of that also requires resources being directed in, in different ways. In Camden, defunding the police or reconstituting their police department meant getting rid of all of the officers, rehiring a hundred of the officers they they had before, and then funding the police in a way that allows for them to do their job differently, to do their job in the way that everyone wants them to do their job. Camden is a city of 75,000 people, as is Kalamazoo. It's the same size city, except for Camden's police budget is $68 million a year. Kalamazoo's is less than half that, 30. Camden has nearly 400 police officers. Kalamazoo has 200, 220. And so if you want to have this sort of interactive and different kind of protect and serve and community-based services, you have to fund it. And if you're unwilling to fund it, then you're not going to have that happen. And there's got to be so much more money thrown into social services. You know, we, we don't have anywhere near enough substance use tr treatment beds. We don't have anywhere near a mental health system that's going to serve all those people that need it. We've taken money away from the, the mental health system for decades. You know, we defunded mental health under Governor John Engler, and the result of that is, is that we now incarcerate more people with mental health issues. It's So going back to what Dr. Walker said, is that the kind of system we want to have? Is that the kind of community we want to live in, or can we do this better? And it's obvious, I think, to everybody that we can do it better. And oh my God, if you have a little boy that's running and hiding behind a car when a police officer drives down the street, that community has a problem. Absolutely, that needs to be addressed um, because you cannot not have that happening. And so, you know, we have to, Obviously, we have to make changes. Obviously, we have to do better. Um, and all of us should, you know, look at look in the mirror because we've 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 you know guys like me that are 50 years old. If this is where we've left Allegra, you know, and, and the other students from Western, and it's. Not a good place. And Jeff, I have a question for you on the budgeting for Kalamazoo. It's like 30 something million dollars you said right now. So over the last 10 years, the budget from Kalamazoo, has it gone up or has it gone down? Don Cooney can probably better answer that question because he was on the city commission, but I'll tell you that it's been pretty flat. And okay. they've, they've had that number of officers of 200, 220, 
for probably the last decade. Before that, I think that the, I would have said that it, the budget went down because they had more officers than that. There was reduced budgets and then it's been flat for probably the last five plus years. Um, Stacy can maybe, or Vic can maybe answer that as well. They only just retired. And then my, ex my other question too is, is I, I was gonna mention the fact that the mental, that um, jail cells have become the new mental institution because money has come, went from um, having case managers and those who can work with people who have mental illness to now they end up in the court system. And I've seen it over and over because I have a nephew that has mental illness and I've watched him go over and over. I was in court one day and it seemed like everyone that went up there seemed like they had mental illness. Um, so from that standpoint, what has a law enforcement done to advocate for mental illness to say, hey, we need money that instead of defunding us, why don't we talk about having money that's going towards helping people who have mental illness so they don't end up in our prison system or our jail. And so then we talk about, well, we need money to build a new jail. We need money to build a new um, juvenile system while, and while others are sitting here in a community that doesn't even have a great community center for the kids to go to the juvenile center. They, they actually, someone would prefer to be there because it's much better than any um, community center and that should not happen. So from a law enforcement side, how are you advocating for the community that you're serving to say, hey, we, we need a community center for these kids. The juvenile center shouldn't be the best place for them. We need help in the mental health area because they're ending up in the jail cell. So you're right, the, the juvenile home shouldn't be the best place, but the juvenile home should be a great place, right? Because the, 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 the children that find themselves there shouldn't be further punished by being in a facility that was built 75 years ago out of bricks and is falling apart around them and doesn't allow for the educational or extracurricular activities that these kids need. But why so are we saying the same thing for the community facility, staff? Having a, a, a up-to-date facility is important. The same with the jail, you know, we're and the same with the Michigan Avenue court building. You know, we're right now working in a building that was built in 1936 to serve a completely different purpose than what it does. And it is dangerous. It is dangerous for jurors, victims, witnesses, court employees, prosecutor employees, and defendants. And now with the COVID-19 thing, it is even more dangerous because it was built to serve a different purpose than what we're using it for. And so now we are all in the same spaces together, employees, jurors, victims, defendants, court staff, all of us are, are intermingling in, in, in a way that is not safe. Um, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be funding other things, right? We, we have a, a mental health court here in Kalamazoo so that we can divert some of the cases. We work with the probation department and the Office of Community Corrections to have an incarceration rate, a prison incarceration rate in Kalamazoo. That's about half of the average for the rest of the state and is by far the lowest of any major county. The rest of the state average is sending 20% of those people convicted of felonies to prison. We send 11%. Here yeah, Jeff, do you give them felonies and then don't send them? Do you give them felonies and not send them to prison? So does a person end up with a felony on their record but didn't go to jail? So the felony hurts them. Sure, sure. Having a felony still hurts, which is why we work on expungement reform, which is why we're, we're backing legislation that's pending in Lansing right now to make it easier for persons to move on with their lives and to have those mistakes that were made in the past not be dragged behind them for the rest of their lives. We're doing all those things, but what we need to do in addition to those things isn't say, take money from the criminal justice system. The money, it, it, it not necessarily the right answer. The right answer is quit taking money from mental health. You know, when the state, when John Engler gutted the state's mental health system, he put all of those vulnerable people in a position where they weren't able to succeed because they didn't have the supports that they needed. And they still don't. And, and 
we have to find ways to provide those supports. We have to find ways to provide substance abuse treatment so that their best option isn't the drug courts that are being run in, in the court system. We shouldn't be looking at the court system to answer those problems, these social problems, whether it's substance abuse or mental health or our veterans court or our juvenile courts or our abuse and neglect uh, family court. We've got nine, 10 separate problem solving courts here in Kalamazoo that we use to keep people out of the system or to provide them with alternatives to incarceration. But using those programs means that somebody's in the system. Those programs need to exist outside of the system so we don't have to bring them into Michigan Avenue or Gull Road in order to get that family the assistance that they need in order to be successful or the person who's currently in a mental health crisis, the assistance they need through, you know, a mental health court and diversion that way. We have grossly underfunded social services in this state, in this country for decades. And that has been, you know, and now we're at this point where we're recognizing that. And so the conversation becomes, well, we've grossly underfunded those social services. How are we gonna get funding to them? Um, because that's what needs to be prioritized is, is, is those programs. Can I hop in right now? Because you've got a few panelists that are chomping at the bit. I know Tony wants to say something. I believe um, uh, our deputy chief wants to say something. I know Stacey needs to say Vic wants to say something. I think Dahlia's up there. So the order that I called you out, jump in, because I know you've got something to contribute. Go right ahead. Well, there's a couple of things. I'm gonna be real. I'm gonna be real quick about it. A couple of things. One, um, uh, in terms of defunding, and in terms of defunding, and I, I, you know, I really don't. Like I said, I think there there needs to be really a much better way of explaining and being more strategic, and just um, you know, flatly throwing around the word defunding. Maybe divesting, and then investing. You know, maybe we need some you know changes in how we in how we look at this because in terms of defunding. Now, uh, how having said that, you know. So just so you understand, they've been defunding the police for years. It's just the wrong ones. They've been defunding. They've been defunding MCOs. I'll give you a perfect example. MCOs, Michigan Commission Law Enforcement Standards. They have 12 employees, but they have a mandate that is huge, okay? I mean, they have a mandate that is huge on what they have to do with 12 employees. So right there alone, they've been defunding MCOs for years. So that, so as far as defund, because, you know, so they've been defunding some, they've been defunding certain aspects of policing. Let's just not, you know, we're not going to say that because that's been happening. So now, so maybe we invest instead. So maybe divest certain, um, you know, maybe we divest, you know, in certain areas and invest in the, and invest in that area. That's, you know, that's one in terms of, you know, if you want to, in terms of reallocating funding. I know last week I brought up three aspects and what any and what needs to happen and, and how um, any funding needs to be allocated in terms of in terms of for law enforcement budgets. Like I said, so you know, in terms of for law enforcement budgets moving forward, I brought up those three aspects. But also I wanted to jump, I wanted to just really quickly, and I know I want um Stacy has a lot to say too, because some interesting things about community policing that, that needs to be said. Um, regarding Camden, uh, one of the things that we talked about last week regarding Camden, New Jersey, and how they reformed their police. See that budget in 2020 is not reflective of the budget in 2013 when this happened. You know, so I think that one, we have to, one, you have to make that kind of a distinction. Also, uh, the budget for Camden is different because that's a, because there's a, it's a countywide uh, system that they're, that they, that they input it. So of course the budget is larger because it's a countywide system and not strictly the city of Camden. And that's how they, and that's in ways they reformed it. Now for Camden, I personally having done a deep dive and a lot of research on it over the past week, I don't personally, I don't think the Camden system as a whole is a workable system in many areas because they, because in essence, they used a Michigan style emergency manager to go into Camden and cancel all the union contracts and those kind of things. I don't believe that works. They, I don't believe that type of system works. That was one of the ways in which they had, that was one of the ways in which they so-called defunded the police, they defunded the local police there and then went to a countywide system and then let, and then let. Uh, municipalities in the county opt out of that policing system. So, like I said, I, it's like I said, and that's that's a 
that's a class for another day that I could teach on those kind of things on that on just that alone and how they and how they did that system. So I wouldn't uh, so for Camden to me Camden is not an accurate view. Like I said, because I brought it to the pot last week and I've done a deep dive. To me, that's not an accurate view on how you reimagine your policing. The end result of Camden is how I feel like you should reimagine because they got to this point because of significant community involvement, significant community leader involvement, significant um, you know interactions by the by the leadership and by, you know by that um, law enforcement leadership, their chief, their you know, significant. So the investment in the police department came after they went through, even once they reconstituted, they still had high use of force rates. They still had all the same things that were issued. They had a they had a police force that was 90% white, even though the Camden itself is like 80% African American. So like I said, so just so you understand in terms of Camden, they said that's not a good view after I got a chance to do a deep dive in. But the same the concept is the same. Significant community involvement is how they got to where they are now. Significant, you know, um, significant changes by chiefs of police and by municipal leaders who had the intestinal fortitude to say, you know what, we're going to make these changes. And guess what? This is what you're going to do. What your first, the first hour of your shift. This is what you're going to do. These are things you're going to do. And no, if you don't like them, you can quit or we'll fire you. So they, like I said, so they had, so they had to be intestinal fortitude and it had to be accountability. And to me, that's you know, that's all a part of a system if you're going to change the culture of policing. Because I, like I said, as far as defunding and defunding and, and refunding and reallocating and all those kinds of things. That to me is more, that to me, unless there's a strategy behind it, unless there's a concrete strategy behind it, to me, you know, and I, to me, that's just, you know, to me, that's just, um, I was getting ready to say something now. That's just, uh, you know, uh, dropping water in the wind. I'm sorry, I was going to say something else. But, <laughs> but um, like I said, and to me, when you have those, when you say that you have to have a strategy behind it, like I said, and, and really, like I said, really need a strategy behind it. And that strategy, like I said, is, is based on development, it's based. It's based on development. It's based on the support, and it's based. And it's based on, um, you know, uh, accountability. Which inside of accountability, uh, you know, it comes. Which inside of accountability is what are you going to do? A lot of times for law enforcement, what's understood is not I want you to do something, but what's going to happen to me if I don't do this? You know, it's kind of like the carrot. It's kind of like the carrot and the stick. When you you know, sometimes some people don't like carrots, so you're going to have to give them a stick. Okay, so and that's why you have to, and that's to me where the accountability comes into play. So, so like I said, so if you use the tools that are available to you that are out there, because there are laws in the books, there are all sorts of things, but we're defunding the agencies that are responsible for hold that are responsible for doing these types of things, holding these types of accountability. My M. Coles has, you know, we're saying, well, um, police officers' records should follow them. M. Coles right now in 2017, Governor Snyder signed a law into the books that says M. Coles that says any law enforcement um, agency that um, when you, at the end of the year, you need to report who's left your agency and why to MCOs, okay? Every law enforcement agency has to report who left your agency and why. MCOs actually only has one person right now that can handle that for all these police agencies throughout the state. Think about that for a second. So what happens if a police agency decides, I'm just not going to report that information? One person can't chase all those folks down. So that's what I'm saying in terms of you have to have, so you have a law that's on the books that says you have to do this and you have an agency that's described to do this, but they've defunded that agency so much that they can't even carry out their mandate for that type of, um, for to maintain that type of a database. So these are the types of things, like I said, that you have to, you know, that, like I said, I mean, if you want to talk about defunding, do your research, let's do the research together and then let's put forth a strategy and then fund the areas that are really important to you. Dr. Wallace, can I can I go? Yep, go right ahead. Go right ahead. Um, reference the video that was heartbreaking. Um, again, it's from the vantage point of from the garage of the house. You see the young man shooting basketball towards the camera. He's bouncing, and he sees the police car comes from his right, and he hides behind the car. And then when the police officer drives by, he goes back to shooting. That reminded me of me and my sons. I'm raising two. Well, we raised two young black men. And so every black parent's fear is of them, their kids having contact with the police. It's astonishing because right down the street from us, there was an officer, um, a white male officer, and our sons went to the same school and we had a conversation. I'm like, hey, have you ever talked to your son? You know, your son driving? He's like, yep. So what conversation have you had with your son when they get stopped by the police? Well, nothing, just, just be polite. 
you know, just be polite. Well, unfortunately, that's not the conversation that I had to have with my child. And a lot of black parents had that conversation. Some people choose not to have it, but I think it's very important that our children understand their rights and what they can do and what to expect from the police. When I'm, I was in public safety, one of the things that I did and pride myself on, and, and uh, Stacy can talk about this, was our community service. We made sure that we established relationships, relationships with people. Once you have relationships with people and they understand where you're coming from and they understand their rights and you just talk to them and just give them different insights and introduce them to people, that really helps the, um, the situation. Tony already talked about defunding, so I'm not gonna talk about that, but I, I just wanna add this piece too. The time is right right now. Look what's going on. All these statues are coming down. They're talking about changing Air Forces and, and, and bases name based on Confederate leaders and stuff. They just passed racism as a public health crisis and to end police brutality. I'm telling you, th these are unprecedented times and this is why this form and this, this is so much, this is so needed because now we have the time, the energy, and the momentum to shape and change things so that we can have the systems that we need to have in place. That's why I think it's very important of what I do here at the Academy to catch these young cadets before they go out into these departments and get coerced or fall into the systems of the culture of the police department. So it takes all of us to make a difference. I look forward to keep working with you all. I'm Please, Deputy Chief, go right ahead. I'm glad you brought that up. One of the most important reforms that we can do as agency leaders is the people we hire. It's critical to hire the right people. I know that for us, we look carefully at, can these people communicate? Are they treating people decently? When we do a thorough background, and I mean a thorough background, what are their relationships with people of all color? Are we hiring the people that we would want to represent us? And I don't think we've touched on that really at all, but that's what we've been striving for when we have hired the past few years. We're not hiring right now, but we have been very critical of the hiring process as well. And I think that's important to point out with for law enforcement agencies in this time and this culture right now. I've seen that video this morning and it was like, everyone's seen it's, it's completely heartbreaking and i have four boys just as well that i'm raising and that talk does have to happen that I, and i hear you loud and clear clear Allegra. I'm, we're not saying that what you're saying is incorrect we're saying that we've made great strides since that time since it beginning when it was that much of a institution we're making great strides to get to a certain point we're trying to do the community policing um, I'm, I jumped in on campus with all the students that we have, the, every group. I go out there and I try and talk to them. Anytime they want to talk to me, my office is always open. We are trying to make that connection, but they, we have to have it together. It's, if I'm out there and I say, hey, I'm going to be out here in front of the Bernard Center at 2 o'clock, and I just want to have a, a down-to-earth conversation what's going on, and only five people showing up, it's not enough. We need inclusion from the community as well. So I'm trying to, we're trying to, and I can only speak for this department as far as what we're doing with community policing and what we're trying to do with the elementary schools and the high schools. I can only speak for this department, but we are trying to spread that same mentorship, uh, inclusion, and like I'm with Stacy with the uh, Black Criminal Students Association. I just became an advisor to young black males and we are trying to reach out to everybody that we can with full transparency of what's going on. None of this, none of these kind of answers that uh, are not the truth, basically. When you start avoiding truth, that's when that trust completely disappears. So in trying to get into that community and trying just to have that complete inclusion, uh, I think we've made great strides. We're not there yet. Vic said this is a great time for all this stuff because of everything that's happening. I mean, the media is showing us, showing police in a bad light completely. They don't show, I mean, you gotta admit, when that 911 call is happening, that 911 call is not saying, hey, we just want you to come over and get some cookies. That 911 call is telling us there's a problem and we need your help. So we, we do have to have a certain degree of police 
involved in that. But just when we get to that situation, there's definitely ways that we can handle it differently from all the stuff that you are seeing on media correct right now. You don't see us at the park handing out food. You don't see us shop with a cop. You don't see that part of what we're trying to do to embrace the community and have the community embrace us. It's not always, it shouldn't always be a bad experience. And we got to change that image for that 10 year old kid that's hiding. We got to change that image and do everything we can to get out there more. If that's all the image you're seeing of us is on the media, we're not out there enough. We need to get out there and we need to embrace the community a lot better. Thank you. Uh, Dahlia, did you want to add something? Yeah, there's, um, there's a few things that I kind of wanted to touch on throughout this, but um, just listening to um, like the conversation and everything, one of the biggest things I've noticed is that you know, everybody's willing to start these conversations and do these things, but it's not, uh, how do I say this? Let me backtrack, how about this? Um, when discussing defunding the police, everybody kind of like takes a step, like, oh no, that's not possible. Who are we gonna call? But they've already defunded social services that who could be those calls, you know? What what about the social services of you know mental health that was mentioned earlier? That's a huge thing for me. Another thing, going to Western, I've noticed that there's so many less scholarships, so many less opportunities for students. Um, along with that, like healthcare, things like that, even the environment and environmental protections, all of these things have be, been defunded throughout the years, but we're still continuing continuing to like funnel all this money into police services rather than, you know, seeing where else it could be put. These like, if you don't want to use the word defunding, um, I heard earlier somebody meant like, or said reallocations. That's a perfect way to think of it, if not defunding. Um, one example I could use would be like, um, I live in Chicago and in the Chicago public schools, um, I know CPS is something else for other people, but it's CPS for Chicago. Um, we have been discussing how to defund the police from schools. You know, they have barely any, you know, school supplies, resources, they're cutting art programs, different things like that in high schools. But we have a $33 million contract with the Chicago Public De Police Department. So things like that, you have to reevaluate where the money is going. If there isn't enough money, then it needs to be reallocated. You know, these programs and things have already been, you know, the funding has been cut left and right. So to now be like, you know, let's defund the police and people take a step back. They're like, no, 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 that's not possible. But it's been done to other programs. And even when like, evaluating maybe from a police's aspect, I am sure that, you know, Plenty of police have been called to, you know, a scene and, you know, they come in thinking, oh, I have to handle this one situation and they come in and it's, uh, whether it's a domestic violence situation, whether it's a mental health issue, whether it's, you know, um, even just as simple as like a college party, you know, the reactions are different when people come in. So like for these kinds of situations, it'd be better if maybe, you know, okay, uh, let's say a situation like you and your friends get into an argument and people start fighting, right? Well, what if you can call a social service that would come in and de-escalate the situation rather than coming in, you know, guns drawn or whatever, saying what's happening? Why is this happening? Let's, you know, cut it out and break up the fight and it possibly even escalating. We should sit back and think, okay, what are the services we could provide to these you know, community members, these students, these children, whoever it is, to like properly provide adequate services. It's not that, you know, it's just, oh, let's demolish the police. It's that we reevaluate and restructure the services that they provide. But um, there was a few other things I wanted to touch on, but there have been a lot of different points that have been mentioned. So if I remember and something comes up, I can jump right back in. Thank you so much, Dahlia. Stacy. I think you're up. Yes, ma'am. I, I just want to first uh, list 
uh, Delia and Allegra, I apologize if I'm not saying your names correctly, just for what they said and lifting that youth voice and community voice that we've heard a lot into the atmosphere as I pivot to, um, I put in the chat and so everybody on Facebook or folks on Facebook may not see it, just talking about community policing being a philosophy, uh, not only a special unit, I mentioned being a community policing officer and even in charge of the co community policing unit, but it's a philosophy that departments can take on. So for instance, in the United States, there are approximately 18,000 police departments running their departments the way they wanna run. And so some of us on this panel have done our share of interviews and a lot of people, not all, who want to go into policing, um, you know, may have watched TV or seen movies and some stereotypical things, if you will, in terms of why they go into policing. Point being, a lot of people in policing may not or do not grasp that concept. But if it's led from the top, if every chief expects it and mandates it, it becomes a philosophy where you shall build relationships. You shall, um, you know, do those types of things with intention, positive relationships, which then leads to hopefully in many cases, trust, problem solving, community partnerships, et cetera, et cetera. And so one of the things I like to caution, and I just want to be real and speaking my truth with that black and blue I mentioned, sometimes depending on the audience, with black people in particular, being mindful of we talked about the foundation of this country with discrimination and racism, et cetera, et cetera. And so we definitely don't want that in terms to be blanketed, be stereotyped. And so I put that on that blue side just as well to say, please don't do that. We are seeing some egregious, horrendous things um, across our country that have to be dealt with. But it absolutely every officer um, is, is not that way. Every white officer is not bad and all of that type of thing. And so I would just even like to lift you, Dr. Wallace, as an example of that um, community policing concept, what can be with your daughter, Layla, and the great programs you have had or where you have brought in with intention, officers coming in and trying to build relationships and being there and first name basis, et cetera, et cetera. Because again, with the honesty, I got a call just yesterday from a white female, lives in Kalamazoo, saw black male doing whatever, ordinarily might have called the police pre Mr. Floyd, but she was more afraid for his life wow. with her calling the police than dealing with the issue at hand. Now, come on, y'all. That, that, I mean, that hurt. And so she was so serious and I just gave you her description to just show you how serious that is. It's not just a black thing. It's not just black folks who get arrested. There are people feeling this way. So we have to make these intentional, um, again, relationships. And so you asked me about TRHT. So I'll just quickly say truth, racial healing, transformation, Kalamazoo. It was birthed uh, by a lady named Dr. Gail Christopher at the WK Kellogg. Uh, foundation. Kalamazoo is one of 14 communities across the country, you all. There are four in Michigan, but we do organic work that's unique to our community to eradicate that uh, racism and discrimination. So I'm the lead of the law design team, but we have many teams, including racial healing. And what do we do in that? We intentionally do what we call racial healing circles in this virtual atmosphere. We do virtual healing experiences to have people talk to each other to meet them and just share of themselves um, to, get e to get to know each person as that individual they are. Because every black person doesn't have the same experience, every white person doesn't have the same experience in any other race and ethnicity along the spectrum. And so I would be more than happy, you know, I put, a, um, I believe the email in there and even the website for folks to look into that. I especially would like to connect with the young people on this panel so we can keep the conversation going so I can show you it works. I've seen it work. I've seen people network and bond and continue on with positive relationships. And that's the work that I still do with officers and Director Ledbetter at his academy. So we're still in this. We got skin in the game and we want Kalamazoo to be the model for the country. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stacey. I, um, I would be remiss if I didn't um, bring in our, our guest who's joining us all the way from vacation. So Daryl Johnson was able to um, on the call, but he's on the telephone, so we're not able to see him right now. Um, 
But Daryl, were there any thoughts that you wanted to share with us as you've been able to kind of listen in on today's conversation? Thought that I had going back to the uh, statement that you made about the young boy hiding from the police. You know, I'm a father of four children, and I think people's perceptions of the police can come from the household that you've come from, as well as the community you lived in, as well as your life experiences. So, without looking into that background, we really don't know, I guess, why that child would have that type of reaction. Was it because his parents told him to be fearful of the police, or is it because what he's seen in his community? So I think it's important as parents uh, to, I guess, present a balanced approach and as we teach our children the values and uh, the things that we think that are important in life to bring up good citizens uh, is to, you know, have these conversations about the role of the police and, you know, look at both sides of the issue and talk about those bad police officers that take those actions and how that's different from other police officers who are law abiding. So that's the only thought that came to my mind during that discussion that really didn't come up is the role of parenting and, you know, the views that we have in our households towards, you know, the police or other things. Thank you, Derek. I would actually like to um, respond to that because, you know, a lot of our lives and our experiences are based on, you know, how you grow up and your environment that you're in. But that doesn't mean that we should just ignore or put to the side the fact that there have been, you know, hundreds of years of these instances of police brutality and just overall systemic racism. Like, it's to sit back and say, oh, we should evaluate why or like, um, like think, oh, that child may have had preconceived um, opinions about the police, and that's why he hid. Instead of sitting back and being like, why is this child hiding? We need to fix that. Like, this child should not be feeling like that he has to hide. Even I personally have, you know, anxiety and fear when I see a police officer. It's people of all different races and ethnicities that they stop and they're like, wait, like, with everything going on, you see it in the media, and even if the media is not reporting on it, you can go and search and find these videos now. And these things have been happening since like years and years ago. Just now they're being recorded. Now they're being put on blast. Now this is, people are having enough. Like we are finally all on the same page where it's like, okay, there is no reason why a police officer should come to a scene you know, be called to a scene or whatever it is and come in with their guns or come in with that conception that they are the person dealing with the situation. They are the person who's going to decide, okay, this person's doing this or this person decided to run, so I'm going to shoot at them. A perfect example of this was recently with um, Mr. Brooks. Um, I believe, I don't want to like butcher his name, but uh, his name was Rayshard Brooks, and he was shot and killed at a Wendy's drive-thru. He fell asleep in the drive, or he parked and fell asleep. He wasn't in the drive-thru. So he was in the parking lot, fell asleep. The cops came. They, you know, spent about approximately 45 minutes giving him this whole sobriety test, this and that, and ended up with him running away and the police shooting and killing him as he was running away. Why is it that anybody feels that it should be, you know, whether you're guilty or not, whether something happened or not, there is no reason that these police officers should come in and use deadly force. Like students even on campus, you can like walk around and maybe there'll be a cop or two driving down the street and you're kind of like, what? Like, you stop and you're like, okay, let me make sure that I'm not doing anything like I have to check myself. But that shouldn't be the case. It should start with law enforcement and start with the people that law enforcement hired. Like the, the conceptions that people have and like the perspectives that people have are not for no reason. The, the acts and the 
the way that people react to law enforcement is because of the things that we've seen, the things that we know. Like whether your parents are like, you should be cautious or not, it's still in the system that, you know, excessive force, that deadly force and these kinds of things are okay. These police officers, law enforcement should all be held to the same accountability that any other citizen is. If any other citizen decided to go and, you know, shoot and kill somebody running away, they would be put in jail for probably the rest of their life. So to sit here and be like, it's okay because you have a badge, it's not, it isn't. And even looking, if you wanted a simpler explanation, um, college parties, perfect example. Why is it that on Western Michigan's campus, it is okay for any other, you know, whether it's Greek life or white organization to have this, you know, huge party, block party, uh, party in one of our main central areas like the Bernhard Center on campus and there is no police presence. But when a black community, black Greek org, things like that have an event, then 15 cop cars pull up all of a sudden to shut down the party. There is no reason for these students to feel that they have to, you know, check themselves because somebody else comes in with their misconceptions of what is happening. But thank I you. Thank you. I will let somebody else go. Thank you so much. <laughs> Honor everyone. Time. I recognize that we're scheduled for an hour and a half, so I know some people might need to drop off, but but we're having a core conversation and Dahlia just made a very provocative statement that I think um, that Deputy Chief and, and Lieutenant might want to address, especially as it relates to um, the parties and things like that. And is there some kind of difference? You know, are different groups treated differently on campus based on their race? Um, because that was actually brought up in our Facebook chat as well. You know, why is it that for black parties, you have to have a, a very heavy um, police presence whereas there are other events that are sponsored off campus by other organizations and it's it's not that way. So I think that that might be a great way um, for us to address that that question. Uh, hi, Dolly. Uh, this is Lieutenant Lovett. I work practically every party on campus. There's a formula that is set up with uh, the rec center, the professor center, with anybody who throws parties on campus that a certain amount of people have a certain amount of officers. And so that formula uses around four officers at the Bernard Center, maybe six or seven officers at the Rec Center. Um, and that's for any party on campus, that's for any concert, that's for anything that happens. It's that same formula. It's not just a for a certain group on campus. Only times that officers respond at the end of parties, it's just to clear out the burnout set. It's not for any trouble. We don't have that many fights at the parties anymore. It's the last time we truly had a fight was we we work with a formula now to include outside campuses and communities to, to come to the parties, but usually that's that formula doesn't always work, and so uh, it's become student only. And we're still working to get that perfect balance of how to have these parties work, but we haven't had any issues at the Bernard Center parties. We haven't had any issues at the Rec Center parties in a long time because that formula is starting to actually work. Now, if the information gets out incorrectly, if the information goes out and say, this party is for everybody in the world and everybody shows up to this party, that's when we have our issues because everybody, every crowd doesn't mix. We can't have uh, 16 year olds coming to parties on campus and 45 year olds coming to parties on campus and thinking that's a party that everybody's going to attend. That's not going to happen. That's for the safety of our students, uh, mainly for the safety of our students. And, and we're just there to make sure we want people to have an outlet. I mean, I was a student at Western from 88 to 93. I was doing talent shows. I DJed on water. So I know you got to have some kind of outlet and you got to have fun on campus. So we're not trying to eliminate that. We're just trying to make sure that party is successful. So we haven't really had 
any issues at the parties. You can we can bring all those parties up and where we actually had to answer them. Um, and matter of fact, to the, it's gotten to the point now that the students are actually policing it as well. So if something happens, the students are breaking it up and saying, hey, we finally got police happening here correctly and we don't want this to happen. We don't want to break this up. So we're actually getting help by the students. I mean, Jim Smith, Officer Smith and myself work practically every party. So if, if my face is not familiar, there hasn't been a party on campus in a while. There actually haven't been parties on campus in a while and that was because of police presence. Um, I've heard many students go and even state that, you know, because of the differences in police presence that they have had to, you know, take a step back and not have parties on campus. And even if it's not based on police presence, there's even been situations where, you know, um, even just something as simple as booking a room or being too loud, things like that will cause issues. And it's just a question of, okay, why are these things bring, being brought up for certain students, but not other students? And it's more of a question of, you know, how are these things being put and how are the, hand, the situations being handled rather than, okay, you have a method in place, but is that method something that has issues like in the method. It's it's not about how the method's being used, it's more about the method itself to reevaluate these situations and go back and be like, okay, maybe this method is more like a microaggression and it's, you know, based off of preconceived, you know, ideas of a certain type of person. But with that method the committee that we have together is pieced together with someone for every different department, including the students. Um, and before, the students would never show up at the meeting. And we were like, we can't really have this meeting without the students' input. And so we really want the students' input so that we can come to the ground, so that we can have parties and, and people feel comfortable having parties on campus. There was a time where everybody took parties off campus, but they were kept being broken up by fights. And so we was like, let's open it back up to campus again and see what happens. But we, we got to have that committee that's put together where we are on the same page. We want that to happen. Before we, Thank you. Before we, before we have to break up here today, Nuchara, I know that you're anxious to, to conclude our, our, our meeting. Um, well, we're all anxious to conclude our meeting after a certain point in time. But I wanted to point out, um, especially to Dahlia and Allegra and, and um, the students at Western, you know, that what you're doing is having an impact. And to all those people that are listening that have demonstrated and protested and have called for reforms, what you're doing is making a difference. Um, this afternoon, uh, former Atlanta cop charged with murder and death of Rayshard Brooks. Uh, Atlanta police officer who fatally shot Rayshard Brooks, a black man, has been charged with felony murder. Fulton County District Attorney Paul Howard announced on Wednesday that now former officer Garrett Wolf would be charged with 11 counts, including felony murder and three counts of aggravated assault. So, you know, I know that sometimes the system doesn't move as fast as, as it seems like it should. Um, and we don't necessarily, people sometimes in positions like mine, don't necessarily respond as quickly as, as it would appear that we should. But um, the right thing is being done. And I think that you guys should you know, give yourself some of the credit for that because for too long, people got away with what happened to George Floyd. People got away with what happened to Rayshard Brooks and they shouldn't um, and they're not and he won't. Um, when somebody's running away, shooting them multiple times in the back, hitting an occupied car in the process of doing that with innocent bystanders isn't acceptable. As you said, somebody else would have been charged already with his actions. Well, he has been charged now. 
that is amazing to hear. I just wanted to quickly point out that, you know, you kind of hit the point of frustration that, you know, we see these instances, we've had them happen for so long, but now that they're being recorded, now that students and, you know, civilians, communities are getting out and protesting these situations, we're seeing change happen more quickly. But that's the point. It's supposed to already happen. So, you know, that's the point of frustration for so many people where we sit here and we're like, okay, we've been watching this happening. We've been seeing these instances. So now it's happening quicker, yes, but it should have been. So I just wanted to, you know, point out that. Oh but God. thank you for that information. Oh, You're you right. can go argument with me. <laughs> You're absolutely right. It should have been. And, you know, I, I, you're, you're right in that it should have been happening long before we've gotten to this point. Um, but I, I take some, um, I don't know, I, 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 some hope from the fact that it's happening now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, um, everyone. Thank you from the bottom, um, from on the behalf of the Western Michigan University Lewis Walker Institute. We truly appreciate this conversation. I know um, there's so much more, like I said, that needs to be done. There's so much that so much work that we have to do. Um, but first, I want to thank each of you for attending because this is something that that's the first step. Charges are the first step. As one of our Facebook um, list viewers said, charges are great. Now we want to see convictions. Um, but with that being said, movement is being made. Um, and also, I want you to understand that just because we're having these conversations does not mean that they will stop here. We still want to work to make sure that our action, that there are actually actions behind our conversations. So we're gonna continue to work. We invite you to get involved in the work of the Lewis Walker Institute. We invite, invite for you to get involved in the work of our Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation across our Kalamazoo um, teams. We invite you to get involved in our Kalamazoo All Pact. These are all ways that we can make a tangible difference in what's going on in our local communities. So no longer is it acceptable for us to sit back and say, oh, that sucks. Oh, people are doing horrible things. Oh, let me complain, 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 but not step up and do something. So if you can hear my voice, I ask you, I implore you, do something. This is your time. This is your time to make a difference. That's what we're doing here. And so we, we thank everyone for your time. Panelists, thank you. Thank you. We could not have had such meaningful, honest conversations without you. Thank you for allowing yourselves to be vulnerable and for allowing yourselves to respond to the tough questions. Because I know we haven't always had easy questions that have come forward, but thank you for answering those questions. And we look forward to having additional conversations and more opportunities to meet again. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful evening.